Thank you, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Great, great. Um, yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you for braving the heat. I think I'm going to melt in the next half an hour. Um, so my name's Ed Moore. I'm a part of a small company called Airborne Engineering. Uh, we do rocket propulsion research and testing. Uh, there's just four of us in the company, and three of us are here at EMF, and we're all having a, a really lovely time. And um, I want to share with you some of the work we've been doing with uh, 3D printing rocket engines, which is an exciting new way of making them. Um, so where are we doing all this? Well, we're at um, Westcott, which is about 60 miles to the east of uh, Radnor here, in, just inside Buckinghamshire, uh, in the middle of nowhere. It was an old World War II airfield, and then at the end of the war, they decided to put all of the, um, the emerging field of rockets and all of the know-how that they captured at the end of the war, they took it all to Westcott. And for about 30 or 40 years, it was really the centre of rocket research and development in the UK. Um, I've got some old footage here from the 1950s of a test of, um, I think this was the RZ2 engine, which ended up powering our first ever ICBM. Um, I must say, you're not meant to do things of this sort of scale and noisiness in Buckinghamshire anymore. It's a bit frowned upon, but back in the day it was all right. Um, I think the engine's going to start up in a second. And you can see there's a man just about to appear who's standing far too close to it uh, for what we're allowed to do nowadays. Um, they also developed things like the Gamma engine, uh, which was used on the Black Arrow rocket, which was, as you probably all know, the only rocket that the UK ever built uh, and launched successfully into space, uh, and then cancelled the whole program afterwards, because that's how we tend to do things here. Um, that was fired not in Buckinghamshire, um, but uh, down in Australia, uh, I think between 1959 and 1961. So it has a, a a good history of rocket testing. Um, unfortunately, it all tended to sort of, it was sort of closed up and went privatized in the 1980s and um, became a sort of general purpose business park owned by a German pension fund. There's now things like a FedEx depot and a place that makes very expensive garden sheds. But it has concrete test bunkers still. And in the last 15 or 20 years, a bunch of companies, ours included, have moved in and refurbished them and um, have restarted it as a test site. So it's quite an exciting spot in the UK for um, rocket research and development. Anyway, enough of a history lesson. Uh, we're here to talk about rocket engines. So I'm going to talk about 3D printing them. Um, but I want to explain first why rocket engines are quite hard to make and some of the challenges in designing them. Uh, and then we can see how we can try and solve some of them with 3D printing. So initially, we'll have a, a, a quick illustration of the basic uh, principle of how a rocket works. So this is a cannon firing, and it nicely illustrates uh, the conservation of momentum, a universal law, which is also known as every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So in this case, the cannon uh, sends a projectile, a lump of mass, the cannonball, out at a really high velocity and the cannonball imparts an identical amount of momentum back on the cannon itself. The cannon being that much heavier accelerates away more slowly than the cannonball does, but the momentum is the mass times the velocity, and they, they have to add up to the same thing. And that's really all that a rocket engine is doing. So here's a picture of a rocket engine. Uh, this is the Space Shuttle uh, rocket engine. Instead of firing cannonballs out the back, it just fires gases, but the principle is exactly the same. Now, if you look at a picture like this, you can just see lots of complicated plumbing and um, valves and things, and it's a bit hard to make sense of. So uh, we've got a diagram of how it actually works. But even still, for the purposes of this talk, uh, this diagram is also too complicated and difficult to explain. So I've made an even simpler diagram of uh, how a rocket works, which will lead for the rest of the talk. <laughs> so what is a rocket engine? Well, it's, as I said, a machine that converts something into uh, momentum in order to generate thrust. And the way rockets work is they take two propellants, a fuel and an oxidizer, and then in one half of the rocket engine, on the left of the image, around here, you, can you see my mouse tip on the screen? Yeah, great. Um, we try and mix the fuel and the oxidizer really well together at a really high rate in order to generate lots and lots of temperature and pressure um, for a gas. Uh, and then we then reach this thing called a throat, where there forms a supersonic shock. And then this right half of the engine takes over, which is called the nozzle. And all that does is it takes all of that extremely hot, high-pressure gas and accelerates it to the highest velocity possible, which is what gives you the momentum exchange. 
So, really, the job of a combust uh, combustion chamber of the sort we might want to 3D print is to make a load of hot gas at high pressure and then accelerate it out. Sounds kind of simple. Um, as ever, it's always a bit more complicated in reality. The first problem that we come up against is the materials we have available uh, to make a combustion chamber. So here's a graph. Uh, on the left is temperature in degrees Celsius, and it's going to be the melting point of a bunch of uh, different materials that we can use to make chambers out of. So aluminium melts at about 660 Celsius. Uh, copper melts at about 1,100 Celsius. Stainless steel has a melting point of about 1,400 Celsius. Inconel, which is a sort of high-performance nickel alloy, slightly less at 1,350 Celsius, but it stays, stays stronger for a much higher temperature, so we tend to rate it above stainless steel as a thing to make rocket engines out of. Then we've got the slightly more weird and wonderful, expensive and exotic materials like niobium. That has a melting temperature of about 2,500 Celsius. And then one of the highest melting point metals of all, tungsten, 3,400 Celsius. Um, that's terribly expensive. Um, the question is, what sort of temperature do we have inside a rocket engine, and therefore what do we have to make our rocket engine out of? And the answer is a really, really high temperature, typically about, say, 3,500 Celsius. It depends slightly on the propellant you're using and whatnot, but it's, um, in general, much higher than the, any metal we could make an engine out of could withstand by itself. So this brings us to basically the central problem of designing a rocket engine, which is how do we keep it cool enough to not melt? Um, we absolutely must do some sort of cooling because otherwise it would fall to pieces in two or three seconds with um, catastrophic results. So we have to take a lot of heat energy out of the rocket very quickly in order to make something that could possibly survive. Um, the way we talk about this in rocket science is by talking about heat flux into the walls of the engine. So that's how much heat is going into the combustion chamber and what rates do we have to take it away in order to stop the combustion chamber walls overheating and melting and the whole thing exploding. It's in units of kilowatts per meter squared and it's not really something for which most people have an intuition uh, until they've been doing it for a while. So I thought I'd make this graph of some sort of helpful household items to give you an intuition of, of what different heat flux values are and where we're living as uh, people designing rocket engines. So sort of basically mildly sizzling an egg is about mm, 15 kilowatts per square meter in a frying pan. Uh, a high power domestic iron is more like 50 to 80 kilowatts per square meter. A really big beefy CPU like a Xeon is something like 100 watts power dissipation in a sort of centimeter by centimeter die, which adds up to about 1,000 kilowatts per square meter or a megawatt per square meter. And probably most of us know the kind of effort you have to go to to keep those things cool, and especially if you're you know, playing overclocking with liquid nitrogen and that sort of thing. Um, we haven't quite arrived at the rocket engines yet, and I was trying to think of another common household object I could put uh, between here and the rocket engine heat fluxes, and I couldn't think of one. Uh, so the only actual one that you might be familiar with is the surface of the sun. Um, so that's up at about 50 megawatts per square meter of heat flux. And then finally, we reach our engineering problem, a rocket engine, where the heat fluxes into the wall are typically a hundred or even hundreds of megawatts of heat flux. So it really is an extraordinarily difficult cooling problem, and it's really one of the central problems uh, for designing a rocket engine is just how to stop it melting. So how do we do that? Well, we can now return to that slightly more complicated diagram of the Space Shuttle main engine for the answer. And as you probably know, the answer is you take a proportion of your fuel which you're going to burn, and you first stick it through the walls of the combustion chamber you have internal cooling channels inside the combustion chamber that absorb heat passing through the combustion chamber wall and then get injected and burnt. It's still really hard to do that. You have to pass them through at tremendously high pressure because if you pass them through, well, it has to be, obviously, it has to be injected at a higher pressure than the combustion chamber pressure, which could be maybe 50 atmospheres, 100 atmospheres. So it has to be injected in at an even higher pressure to be injected in the first place. And also, because the temperatures on the combustion chamber walls are so high, most things would boil straight away. So you have to pressurize them a great deal in order to get the boiling temperature up. And therefore, 
make them able to absorb enough uh, heat from the combustion chamber. So what does a typical combustion chamber in a conventional rocket look like? Well, it's a bit like this. Here on the inside is where the combustion is happening. And this is a cross section that someone has cut from a, a combustion chamber. I don't know if you can really see it on the picture, but it's actually made of two parts. There's a copper part here and then a nickel jacket on the outside. So the way you make these is you start off with a huge lump of copper and you machine a big hole in the middle to get the inside diameter of the combustion chamber you want. And then you turn down the outside to get the outside diameter of this copper fin part that you need. And then you put it up on another machine and start milling channels all the way through the contour of the rocket engine. Turn it around a bit, do another one, turn it around a bit, do another one. This can all take days to weeks, as you can imagine. Then you fill all of these freshly machined channels with wax and polish them down smooth to be at the same height as the copper fins. And then you burnish conductive silver powder onto the top of the whole thing. And then you can con connect it up to electrodes and sink it into an electroplating bath to make it nickel plated and over several weeks up to months grow layers of nickel on the outside to give yourself a reinforcing um, jacket to support the weight of the copper. Copper is a very good uh, heat conductor. It's good at uh, transmitting heat from inside the combustion chamber into the cooling channels, but it's not very strong, so you often want another material um, on the outside, like Inconel, which has a bit more strength. Then you have to somehow melt all of the wax out of the cooling channels, and then clean them all up, and then you're ready to put your rocket engine into service. And this whole process can take, um, as I said, weeks to months of skilled technician time, and it's part of the reason that conventional rocket engines are really very expensive to produce. And this is where 3D printing comes into play. So the kind of 3D printing we're using is obviously metal 3D printing, and it's specifically a technique called powder bed fusion. And the way that works is that you lay down uh, a layer of powdered material, uh, powdered metal, the particular alloy you want to make the thing out of. It's typically maybe particles of 30 to 60 microns thick, which is sort of talcum powder consistency. You lay a layer of it down, and then using lasers, you, much like a normal plastic 3D printer, you run a contour pass around the edge and then hatch with a laser a, a fill pass in order to melt the powder together. And then an arm comes over the top and lays another layer, layer of powder down. And then the laser starts again melting together the powder on top. As you can imagine, the laser operates at really high temperature. And so um, you have to do some additional processes because every time the, the melt pool uh, solidifies after the laser's passed over it, it contracts slightly and that puts a lot of surface tension into the part. So once you've made the part in the laser bed and it's surrounded by a load of unmelted powder and you've dusted it out, you pull it out of the bed and you then have to heat treat it to relax all the internal stresses. So what we can do is design an engine for 3D printing and this is what we did. So here's a cut through of our engine. This is actually this engine here. Um, and hopefully I can, oh no, uh, let's try this again, yeah, you can see, I hope, um, all of the internal cooling channels here printed in, you probably can't, but you can print it into the chamber wall. And you can see they're slightly rotating as they go up because we have them as curved paths. That means that the path that the propellant, the, that the cooling propellant flows through takes slightly longer to get through so it can absorb a bit more heat. You can also see some other features uh, up the sides. So because this was an experimental engine, when we're still feeling our way with 3D printing engines, we put in loads of little holes that allow us to put temperature sensors and pressure sensors into the channels and into the fins so that we can figure out the heat transfer into the propellant. One of the particular things with metal 3D printing is that the surface it leaves is slightly rough and that causes actually quite a lot of loss of pressure when you pump a fluid down the cooling channels, which means you need to pump fluid in even higher pressure, which is a bit of a drawback because it's quite hard to pump fluids at really high pressures in rockets, especially when you need your pump to weigh as little as possible. So we're, using, we're measuring the pressure losses down the channels and the temperatures into the channels. Um, this is our engine 
uh, actually on the powder bed. Um, this is us taking a picture through the window. So I mentioned uh, that the whole thing is when it's finished printing, it's stuck inside the powder bed and you have to kind of dust all the powder off and pull it out. This brings you onto the first trap for if you're pr printing your own rocket engine, and that is how on earth do you get the powder out of the cooling channels? Because if the, pow if the cooling channels are blocked with powder, the propellant won't flow through there, and within about one, maybe two seconds of lighting the engine, the whole thing will melt and fall apart. It's incredibly hard to actually see into this thing in the first place. Obviously, it's a solid piece of metal, so we can resort to some um, clever tricks and take it to an X-ray spectroscopist who can take these absolutely lovely images. I don't know if you can see. Of, uh, the, it's a section of a uh, scan that is going through, like an MRI machine of the rocket engine, and it's a, yeah, an X-ray tomography machine. And if I pause it here, can you see some of these channels are cloudy and grey and some of them are nice and crisp and black? That's the bad sign. That's the powder in the block channel and these are the open channels. So depowdering is a really hard problem but you must do it before you do the baking process, the annealing process afterwards, because once you've annealed it, the whole printed part to reduce the stresses, any trapped internal powder also tends to bond to its neighbor bits of powder and absolutely can't be shifted. So we have access to these sort of quite expensive and fun ways of uh, looking inside the, um, the combustion chamber channels to see if they're clear or not. If you don't have access to uh, someone with a very expensive computer x-ray machine, there are cheaper techniques for seeing if it's working. And this actually is very effective too. Um, we can just pump water through and then see if each individual fountain is going to the same height and then you know, just get like piano wire or some other stiff wire and stick it down to try and empty out the channels. But it, it really is actually quite a hard problem is depowdering the um, channels and whenever we have customers' engines, it's really one of the first things that tends to go wrong is there's still a bit of powder blocking something and as soon as you have that, it's game over and things melt straight away. So if you manage to do all that, you can then put your engine on one of our test stands. Um, here's our test stand, one of our test stands at Westcott. This is the engine, I promise, but it's completely buried under loads of instrumentation, uh, as I mentioned earlier, because we're measuring hundreds of different things about the engine to try and understand the alloy and the printing process better. But anyway, I'll just show you a picture of an engine firing. I don't think the sound's working, so you'll have to supply your own sound effects, but it basically sounds like... <laughs> like that. Um, we just tend, thank you. Um, we just tend to do short firings because it actually really doesn't take long for the internal firewall to get up to a sort of equilibrium temperature and we can get the data we need without burning too much propellant. So, could stop the talk there because we printed the 3D, uh, we've 3D printed a rocket engine, but actually 3D printing is a really exciting and brand new technique. And instead of just merely doing the same thing that we've been doing for decades, but cheaper. Why don't we actually play around with what 3D printing will let us do that's new and see if we can do anything a bit more fun and innovative? And that's specifically what we've been working on um, the last few months. So let's go back and have a look at uh, what the heat transfer into the wall of a combustion chamber actually looks like. Here's a sort of typical graph from a paper. It looks a bit baffling, but the dotted line is the shape of the combustion chamber. So this is the combustion chamber that's the throat, and here's the nozzle. I think the scale's slightly exaggerated, but the nozzle expanding out. And the solid line is the heat transfer going into the walls. So the injectors are up here at sort of this end of the rocket. You can see the heat transfer down here is very low because they haven't burned yet. They take a few millimeters to mix and burn. Then things start to heat up. You get pretty constant heat transfer, say 20 megawatts per square meter. This is quite a modest experimental engine. Something like the Space Shuttle engine is 10 times more heat flux. But as you'll notice, as soon as you get to the throat, this contraction, the heat flux absolutely spikes colossally. It's four or five times higher. And that really is the hard part. The part that has the highest strain on the engine is right at the throat. So can we play any tricks to try and alleviate the thermal stresses right at the throat? And one thing you might want to think about, which we have been thinking about, is trying to do something with the printer in order to let us kind of leach some of the cooling fluid, some of the propellant fluid, through the walls in a specific location, like the throat, in order to create a sort of cool, uncombusted thermal barrier layer around the throat. All of the combusting stuff that's really hot 
will be here, but all this stuff will be uncombusted and just provide a little bit of um, dissipation to, to stop the metal being under such enormous strain. And indeed, you can actually do that, it turns out, with metal 3D printing. So I mentioned earlier that it's a bit like a sort of wire a plastic 3D printer. You do a sort of contour pass and then you fill in with the laser, the hatching pattern in the middle. Well, what if you slightly expand the width of the hatches and don't overlap them so you don't end up with a completely solid material? It turns out you can potentially try and get a material that's sort of slightly porous and might actually let some propellant sweat through. So we did a bunch of samples with different laser parameters, different laser powers, different distances, different contour speeds. Um, polished and analyzed them, and you can see there's a sort of one that's very porous and would be not strong enough. Here's one that's completely solid. Um, and we tried a few, uh, selected a sort of laser parameter that looked promising, and then printed some test pieces that tried out this kind of transpiration trick and a couple of other tricks to try and let some of the propellant leach through. So here's a test sample. What you're seeing here is something we printed just to test on a bench. The water goes in here. This is like a sort of example bit of combustion chamber firewall and comes out there. And we've put a few tricks in to try and help the propellant leach out of the walls here. Um, and hopefully this video will work. Yeah, so you can see when you flow the water, it actually starts to leach out, which might provide us exactly the sort of local um, cooling that would really help things along. Why is this important? Well, as you probably know, I wanted actually to show you a picture of the SpaceX Falcon 9 landing, but I that couldn't find a Creative Commons one, so I'm going to show you our own much more modest version that we built at Westcott. Um, this is called Gyrock, and it's a little sort of lunar lander hopper. Um, it basically just lifts up. This is, the, this is the most we can fly it at Westcott in what's basically an industrial park. We have to keep it under a rope in case it decides to shoot off and go into the next village. Um, but it takes off and lands. We're hoping to do some free flights at the range soon. But we've built this um, in order to try out a bunch of ideas for the UK and the European Space Agency for things like lunar landers. They're of the opinion, and it's quite exciting and probably true, that actually for exploring the moon, rockets might be better than wheels because there's very little gravity and there's no atmosphere. Lunar rocks are big and get in the way. So why don't you just do lots of hopping instead of trundling around everywhere very slowly? And the answer is because conventionally, rockets don't like being fired lots of times. People think that the lifetime of a rocket is defined by how long its burn time is. But actually, if you just turn it on once and leave it for you know, many tens of seconds to minutes, it's often quite happy. What actually kills rockets is the thermal cycling, is the being turned on and being turned off. So this is where we're quite excited about 3D printing, because we might be able to try out some tricks like that transpiration cooling and like what I'm about to show you now that will actually help with the problem of this thermal cycling and make us be able to make rockets, rocket engines that could be used for lunar landers that would do maybe tens or hundreds of hops, or even experimental rockets on Earth that carry up student payloads and land again, you know, tens or hundreds of times, which would bring the cost right down. So this is pictures from a, a NASA paper. Um, they basically took a bunch of combustion chambers and fired them to destruction and then took slices of them, all at great expense to the US taxpayer. But they published it all, so I can show you the pictures. Um, here's a section of combustion chamber, a bit like what I showed you earlier. Here's the coolant channels, and then the combustion chamber is in here. These are, I think, copper channels that they then brazed to the nickel outer. And so when you turn your engine on, you get a load of cold propellant uh, on this face of the coolant channel. It could be room temperature, it could be like cryogenic um, helium or methane at minus 100, minus 200 Celsius. And then just one millimeter later on the other face, it's at about 3000 Celsius. And this creates an absolutely enormous, uh, enormous uh, differential thermal strain across this firewall. This bit wants to expand hugely, but can't because it's butted right up against the adjacent channels. This bit wants to contract, but there's also quite high pressure in here relative to here, so it sort of wants to shrink, but also bend outwards a bit. So this is a picture from before they fired it. And then after a few firings, you can see that it's sort of, you know, the shoulders are starting to plastically deform from rubbing up against each other and get a bit out of shape. A few more firings, you can see this thermal strain is starting to bow the wall out. 
and it's bowing out on the inside again because the pressures are wanting to push it that way because it's higher pressure inside the cooling channel than inside the combustion chamber. It's getting very exaggerated at this point, and interestingly as well, you can see the metallurgy is changing. So instead of lots of little crystals, one big crystal of copper is growing here. That's the downside of using pure copper. It's very good thermal conductivity, but it wants to form big crystals. And then eventually, pop, and the engine is dead. That's a dead engine at that point. And it's precisely those cycles of like heating up, cooling down, but not quite elastically relaxing to where you were before, but still staying a bit deformed, and then the next time getting a bit more deformed, and then a bit more deformed. That's what kills an engine. So one of the things we've been trying with 3D printing is why don't we actually print gaps between the coolant channels so that they have enough room to actually elastically deform and then relax again afterwards. And in fact, this is just a, a small test sample we printed. This is a, a special uh, alloy called copper chrome niobium called GR COP42, but it's an alloy. So it's got very good strength. It's got good thermal conductivity. It's been designed to be 3D printed. And because it's an alloy, it is much less prone to growing pure crystals. All the impurities inside keep the crystals small and keep it more elastic. And we've actually printed a whole combustion chamber uh, copper section for it now. And it's going into this engine, which is, um, we're, oh, sorry, that's wrong. Uh, we're printing at the moment. So we've got the copper parts. It's going to be about this sort of size, uh, 20 kilonewtons of thrust. That's about two tons of thrust. It would be enough, for example, to take microgravity experiments up into space, get a bit of weightless time, and potentially try and land again like a SpaceX rocket, um, but have, you know, maybe. 50 to 100 flights, who knows? Uh, it's uh, ambitious at this stage. Um, but it's uh, something that we're hoping to fire in the next um, few months. We're just printing this uh, in canal outer jacket at the moment, but the, the copper bits incorporate all the tricks we've talked about with transpiration cooling, and these are flexible jackets. Um, so here's just some pictures um, of some other engines we fired recently, which I'm going to use to conclude um, the talk. Really, uh, how do you print a 3D, a 3D printer rocket engine? Is we don't actually know. It's really exciting, and there are loads of ideas that we could try, and no one's really sure yet. So it's a really fertile time to um, come and have a go. And then a final plug for a competition we've been holding. If any of you have ideas for how to 3D print things, and any of you are students, um, we've been last year and again this year. We often we've opened up our test site for like a week or two as a sort of free for all for student groups to come and bring their rocket engines and we'll fire them in a safe environment and keep the students in a bunker safely. Because there are so many student groups trying out 3D printed rockets now, but their university health and safety department say, you must be joking, never talk to me again. Um, and they come to us and say, Can we test it? And we're like, Well, we're kind of busy or you know, it would take us you can't afford us, but we've managed to block out a bunch of time where we'll just you know, clear the decks and just say, come and have a free-for-all. Um, it's called Race to Space. You apply, you get a test day. Uh, we're doing it again this July. Um, so yeah, if you have any good ideas for how to improve rockets with 3D printing, then um, please come and uh, apply and come and talk to me afterwards. I think I've got these things here, these engines. You can come and feel them. We've got a cutaway so you can actually see the internal geometry. Um, I guess we'll probably wander towards the bar with them because I've understood they're running out of beer. So um, thank you very much for your attention.